I was on the road for presentations and then home in Austria for a while. It was time again to send out a Sunday sticker album, a non-profit project I had started 15 years ago with fellow priests in Liechtenstein as a service to parishes. It meant counting tens of thousands of stickers and not trying to get high on glue. I found myself listening to Homer to brush up on the Greek epics that had come up in a book I had read recently. I will try to make this clear by the history of another and very much less important word. The word gentleman originally meant something recognizable. One who had a coat of arms and some landed property. When you called someone a gentleman, you were not paying him a compliment, but merely stating a fact. Need forbid if you should judge. It would be wicked arrogance for us to say that any man is or is not a Christian in this refined sense. And obviously a word which we can never apply is not going to be a very useful word.
October 2 was to see a project of amelioration, and for that I needed stuff. I was a bit uneasy to dig up the floor. I liked it, it was rough, no need to take off shoes. All it really was was flagstones held together with patches of cement, laid straight onto naked dirt by the previous owners. But in consequence the floor was consistently cold. It is easy to see how this was not ideal in winter, you lose heat. If you think at least it would be nice in summer, you would be mistaken. It was primarily on account of the summers that I had decided to act. For when warm, humid air cools against the cold surface, you get condensation. The floor would be positively wet at times in July or August. Factor in that I'm not always here, and gone frequently, especially during the summer, and you can see how this creates problems. It is not very pleasant to catch a whiff of mold when you enter after a month-long absence. To counter this, you need to raise the surface temperature, and that's why I had to dig up the floor. It needed to be insulated.
porta sopra e mostro che sopra bisogna che siano un po' pesi, ma la corta non le tira non le pizzica ma non è che abbiamo una tanto solo così che no ma quella arriva però così non la roviniamo esatto Then it was off to Switzerland, where I had to give a retreat. I've been an observer and somewhat fascinated by the Jordan-Peterson phenomenon. One of the interesting things is how many young men are drawn to his call to stand up straight, clean your room, tell the truth and take responsibility. 
he challenges people with great success. I compare this with the messaging in my church, where for decades in many places the opposite was proposed in pastoral meetings, and still is by an aging generation of those comprising much of the leadership. The wisdom was, and is, at least for some, to demand less and less from people, cuddling the faithful. The result? The men were the first to abscond themselves. By looking at today's pews in many parishes, it would appear that there are more manly religions than Christianity. The months I spent in Jerusalem many years ago, I found myself pondering this question looking at the bearded patriarchs of the ultra-Orthodox Jews and the sea of Arab men streaming to the Temple Mount for Friday prayer. Was my own faith more effeminate compared to those? There is a grain of truth in that. There is an emphasis of the female element in Christianity. The Church understands itself as the Bride of Christ. Its type is female. Its clergy, representing Christ, isn't. But still, as Church collectively and our souls individually, both are understood in the typology of a spousal relation, in which Christ is the head and groom. So a certain machismo will never adequately reflect the Christian spirit. But all of this has been true from the beginning. It was true for the followers of Jesus, for the Church Fathers, for the first monks. But by no means does a reflection on history fail to show the most manliest of men embracing the cross. Even a few decades ago, a page from a magazine for altar service I bought on eBay out of curiosity had the image of Bishop Francis Xavier Ford, a U.S. Catholic missionary who in 1952 died in a communist prison in China. Nothing in his story is effeminate. I liked the vintage artwork and framed the page that also asks its youthful readers in bold letters, will you take his place? It is a call meant to inspire, and to much more than cleaning your room though I'm pretty sure the good bishop kept his office tidy. Christianity, while rejecting machismo, is certainly manly. Currently, we just appear to make that hard to see for many men who keep the distance. Catholics, without a doubt, would do well to overcome the insufferable clericalism of banal modern liturgies that condemn the faithful not only to a new passivity, practically infantilizes them. The whole strength of the clear old rituals is to give men something to do without being emasculated. This is one of the reasons, I suspect, why men in particular are drawn to traditional liturgies in East and West. But I digress. Aside from the draw that Jordan Peterson has on young men, something I suggest we as priests should at least reflect on, there's an even more important thing that astounds me. Namely, how many people say they have returned to a life of faith on account of him? It is not that it is embarrassing that a Canadian psychologist can motivate more people to reflect on God than a worldly bishop preaching his shallow gospel promising reforms to journalists. What is astounding is that Peterson himself is not exactly a believer. Now, much has happened over the years. He may have come to hold new positions and abandon others in the meantime. I do not know. The recent story of his wife and her discovery of the rosary is very touching. But if I'm not mistaken, so far in his books, at least those that I've read, and the interviews that I've heard, Peterson is not a Christian but rather a follower of the Swiss analytical psychologist Carl Gustav Jung. That is to say, he is fascinated by the stories of the Bible. He will spend hours unpacking what he thinks are hidden meanings of Genesis and Exodus. He is touched by the message and life of Jesus. You could even say that he is convinced of their truth. But he is not sure if any of it has actually happened in any real way. Jesus, for all that Peterson has stated, may never have existed at all. 
much less being the actual Son of God made flesh. The particular story, or better the myth, he holds to be of the greatest value. But whether it is really historical, to him seems secondary. That is perfectly Jungian, but it is not Christian in any real sense. Even if Peterson should since have changed his views, what remains is the fascinating circumstance that according to many comments I've read over the years, Peterson has been instrumental in the newfound belief of many, or in their taking it more seriously, all the while not being a believer himself. Maybe yet. I'm not sure what to make of that, or if indeed the newfound faith of some will bear the same mythological marks as Peterson's. I unsurprisingly agree with him that the story of Christ is the greatest story ever told. I even agree that if it had not really happened, Christ's story, turning the logic of the world and even many conceptions of the divine on its head, would still make it the greatest and most unexpected story. The strangeness and persistence of Jewish monotheism, the scandal that not a God, but the transcendent God became man, the logic of the cross defeating the logic of the world, the hour of defeat being really the hour of victory, loss being the only gain. It is a story of paradox. If many today fail to see its strangeness, it's because of the triumph of that very story. Tom Holland's book, Dominion, gives one account of it. He, another non-believer, suggests that even the modern rejection of God and the apparent alternative values promoted by its Western opponents can only be really understood in light of the paradoxical victory of the cross. Again, I agree, it may be the greatest story, and it would contain great truths even if it were only a myth. But I contend it is not a mere story. I contend that its most important claim is that it is historical truth. The first great enemy of Christianity, who had persecuted the apostles, has said as much after unexpectedly being thrown off his high horse and seeing the light. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testify of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied, says St. Paul. The early Christians did not just look for timeless wisdom, even if it came from the greatest story ever told. They were concerned with one thing, did it happen? His life, his death, his resurrection. Only if these are historically true are we not to be pitied. Only if these things really happened do they warrant to turn the whole world and its fateful logic on its head, as Christ had done. So, did it happen? And which argument would convince you.